So what we're going to do now is add a lateral boundary to the problem. So we'll put a wall here on the western side of an ocean basin. Okay? And so we'll say that in the x direction we have geostrophic balance. Um, and there's no flow through that wall. So um, we set u equal to zero. Right? So if we set u equal to zero, this term disappears, this term disappears, this term disappears. So what that leaves us with is, as I said, geostrophic balance here in the x direction. So how does that work? Well, we're up against a wall here. And if, there's a, if the fluid is heaped up against the wall, then the pressure force will be pushing out into the fluid, okay, the pressure gradient force. And the Coriolis force presumably will be balancing that. So what we've got there is southward flow. Okay? On the other hand, if there's a dip against the wall, pressure gradient force is pushing you towards the wall and the Coriolis force is balancing that. So you've got northward flow. So you've got these oscillations between northward and southward flow as you get these crests and troughs up against the wall. And that whole thing is propagating like a wave. You can see that from the other two equations. Right? The other two equations are just the same thing we had before. So they're just going to give us a northward or southward propagating gravity wave, non-dispersive, with a constant phase speed, c equals root gh. Now you can see on this diagram it says wave propagating, propagation is southwards. We haven't proved that yet, okay? but we will. So how do we prove that? So we've used these two equations to find this simple dispersion relation. We haven't actually used the geostrophic balance equation yet, so let's have a look at that. First, let's think about what the solution for V might look like. Well, we've got a non-dispersive wave. We know that for sure. It only has one speed that it can go at. So let's think about what the solution for V is here at time t at the origin here. It must be equal to something which came from the north, okay, V1, plus something which came from the south, V2. And that's all it can be. It, anything at time t, it must consist of the sum of what was a distance c times t away, either to the north or to the south. It must be the sum of those two things. And nothing else, because anything else has either gone too far or hasn't arrived yet, because there's only one speed that these waves can propagate at. And so we say V is the sum of V1 plus V2. V1 is going southwards, V2 is going northwards. Right? <coughs> the corresponding solution for eta is this. It's a coefficient times minus V1 plus V2. And you can prove that by substitution. So if you take uh, these expressions for V and eta, substitute them back into the equations, you'll see that what you get is just advection of V1 and V2 southward advection for v1, northward advection for v2. Okay? So that proves that this is the right expression for eta. So then if we take that expression for v and substitute it into the geostrophic balance equation, then, well, we end up with two equations separately for v1 and v2 because they're independent and they must both independently be in geostrophic balance. right? So we can write down an equation for v1, an equation for v2. So this is dv1 by dx is proportional to minus v1, and dv2 by dx is proportional to plus v2. So they have, in x, they have exponential solutions. So the v1 has a decaying exponential solution in x. v2 has a growing exponential solution in x, which cannot be matched with any realistic uh, interior solution. So um, we reject the solution for V2 as being unphysical, and we retain the solution for V1. So that implies that our Kelvin wave must be propagating southwards. It's only V1 which works. And it decays away from the coast, this coastally trapped wave solution, um, with a boundary layer width. You can see from these equations it's uh, root GH over F, which is the Rossby radius. Let's try and extend that now. So what we've done so far is we've got a Kelvin wave on the western side of an ocean basin. And our coordinate x was positive towards the center of the ocean basin. Okay. 
How about if we put it on the other side of the ocean basin? So our coordinate x will be negative towards the center of the ocean. So we've changed the sign of x in our equations. And if you go through the same logic that I've just been through with v1 and v2 and everything, you'll find that that change of sign leads us to the conclusion that the wave must be propagating northwards. We've changed the sign of that as well. And it kind of stands to reason because uh, the Coriolis force is pushing you to the right when you're going forwards, pulling you away when you're going backwards. So a propagating wave would want to keep the, the supporting coast on its right in the northern hemisphere. Okay? And that leads me to wonder what's going to happen if I say there's no flow through the northern wall here. So I have a y coordinate. So I go through the same logic. Again, I have a minus y here. So y diminishes towards the center and becomes negative towards the center, if you like. And the conclusion would be if we crossed out that equation, we had geostrophic balance in the north-south direction, we would have a Kelvin wave propagating westwards. So you can see what's happening. The Kelvin wave is propagating around the ocean basin with the coast on its right. So in the northern hemisphere, Kelvin waves kind of lean against the coast with the coast on its right as they propagate. And that's why I put this picture of the English Channel, because the tides, the tides come from the Atlantic Ocean and come through the channel, and you can describe them as a Kelvin wave. Right? And they're leaning against the French coast. The amplitude of the tidal variation is much higher on the French side than it is on the English side. Right? You can see these, these tide amplitudes are 10, 11 meters here near San Malo and only about two or three meters near Southampton. So that's Kelvin waves, that's, that's extratropical Kelvin waves. Let's look at the southern hemisphere. So what happens now if we go into the southern hemisphere? Which way is it going to be propagating? Well, we've got to change the sign of something again. We've got to change the sign of F, right? So with negative F, it'll do the same thing. It'll, sw it'll flip the sign and our conclusion will be that the Kelvin wave must be going northwards. Flip that over to the other side and it's going southwards. And then the mirror image here, what we've done here is we've flipped the sign of F and of Y. So two sign changes, so it's going the same way as it is in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's still a mirror image, right? And so you've got waves going round anti-clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. They're going round clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And you have to, you have to wonder what's going to happen if they meet here at the equator, right? Are uh, they going to carry on along the equator and then go out again? Is that possible? Well, yeah. That is an equatorial Kelvin wave, and it can only happen on the equator. And so let's imagine that you put a great big wall in the ocean. Then, then that would be a northern boundary for this, and it would be a southern boundary for this, and you'd go around. And then let's say very suddenly you just remove the wall, and the Kelvin waves which were leaning on that wall well, they just lean on each other, okay? That's, that's a way of imagining it, okay? So the, the Kelvin waves are just leaning up against each other as they trundle along the equator here. But that can only happen on the equator where the sign of F changes, 